well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, jump into the presentation. It's actually going to be more of uh, a lot more live demo than presentation. So um, I'm not going to worry about all the, the whole intro stuff. You guys have probably seen me before. Uh, I guess I'll put a plug for my new employer, Bluehost, and that uh, we'll get going. Um, so like I said, this is going to be more live demo than presentation. Um, there's going to be a lot. Feel free to ask questions at any point. Um, and we'll, we'll try to cover them, though I might at some point on those just say, well, we, you can ask me afterwards and, and keep going for uh, time constraints. So actually, let's see. Let's get that started. OK. Uh, also, if you do ask questions um, and I don't repeat it, um, remind me to repeat it for sake of the audio recordings that are being done. So. Uh, so anyways, there's me. Um, I do have the slides currently at that URL listed. Can everyone see the text? Fine. Because this is about as much graphic as they're going to be. It's going to be text throughout all this. So we're good? Okay. Uh, I'm also going to be jumping between terminals. Uh, the text on top for the tabs is a little small. But uh, I have a couple of VMs. We'll, I'll point out the layout of the, what we'll be using for the, for the demos here in a little bit. Um, so we'll be jumping around through those uh, as we look at different machines. So here's a little bit of an overview of uh, what we'll be talking about. Uh, real quick, who here has used S who knows what SSH is? OK, good. Uh, how many um, use it on a regular basis? OK, um, let's see. How many of you know what, what uh, sockets are, both TCP sockets and Unix sockets? OK, a little less. Um, so there are some things a little later that might not make so much sense then, but uh, hopefully the, the, the concepts still come across. So anyways, here's the overview of what we're going to talk about. Um, so we'll, we'll go over a little bit of an SSH overview, some of the tools that we're, be, that we're using, and then we'll start talking about some of the different things that you can do uh, using OpenSSH mainly. Uh, we'll talk about configuration, uh, public key authentication, SSH agent, uh, forwarding, proxy command, uh, control faster, some good practices, SSH, yeah, etc. We actually probably will be skipping the Ansible one. Sorry. Uh, so anyways, uh, here's the tools that we'll be using uh, throughout the demo. Of course, a terminal. Got to love those. Uh, I'm using the open SSH client and server. Um, some of these things um, are, or most of these things are available with other SSH clients. The big one that I'm thinking of is PuTTY. Um, though s some of these features might not be supported by other clients. And also some of these features, you need newer versions of the uh, server and client than are what in most um, prevalently used versions of distributions. Um, specifically, what I'm using uh, in the demo is um, Debian Jesse. So, yay, it got, finally got released a week and a half ago, something like that. Um, so, it's OpenSSH 6.7 based. Um, some of these features, like for example, I know on um, like Red Hat 6 and 5, some of these features aren't there. So um, we're going to be using Netstat a little bit to look at what's listening and to, to try to find out what some of the underlying network communication looks like. And uh, for some of our for the forwarding demos, we're going to be using the Python simple HTTP server. So um, here's a little bit what the demo environment looks like. Um, we, there's a total of three VMs. The uh, first two, we have one called Jesse One and one called SSH Gateway. Those two can talk to each other uh, on this 192.0.2.1 uh, subnet. And then the SSH Gateway is connected to another VM called App01 uh, that's in 172.12.0 uh, subnet. So something that's probably not too dissimilar from what most people would find in a uh, kind of production type environment where your, your workstation is separate from your production systems and you have a, an SSH jump host in the middle that you need to use to be able to access production. So hopefully, hopefully this is a scenario that many of you have seen before. I'm guessing it is. 
So uh, to talk a little bit about um, SSH, uh, it's, it's much more than just a simple shell. Um, as a replacement for tel you know, most people just use SSH as a replacement for Telnet or RSH. And it works great for that. I mean, the, the improvements that it provides over those is, is far and away enough to justify using SSH. But it does provide many other facilities that, that sometimes people kind of gloss over or don't know about uh, or just kind of take for granted. And so that's what this is uh, kind of meant to, to go over is some of, some of those aspects of things. Um, some of the cool things, of course, there's, there's server and client verification. The, the, both sides of the, of the connection can verify who they are talking to. Um, file transfer, um, SFTP and SCP, et cetera, are, are a great uh, value out of SSH. It allows you to easily copy files between boxes. I actually had a friend uh, point out something cool about uh, SCP to me last night that I thought was, that I hadn't known. I thought it was pretty cool. We might get to that a little later. Um, you can do proxying, SOX proxies. You can do, uh, do forwarding for different things. Um, the, the underlying structure of how SSH works allows for a great deal of flexibility in what kind of things can, can go across SSH. And, and it's used by a wide variety of applications. Um, rsync, whenever you're, well, one very common use with rsync across different machines is to tunnel it through SSH. Um, that way you get an encrypted session and you're authentic, you get some authentication versus just the plain rsync daemon where it's going to be in clear text. Uh, SP, uh, Ansible and Salt both uh, make use of uh, SSH quite a bit. In fact, Ansible, um, all of, pretty much all of its remote execution is done just through SSH. That way you don't have to have a dedicated agent for your um, orchestration software running on the host. You just have to have the SSH daemon, which you probably already have. Um, so anyways, here's the only other bit of, gra of graphical stuff we have in here, and it's not much. So this is a little bit about how the architecture of SSH works. At the very bottom level, you have some kind of connection between your SSH client and the SSH server. Usually, that's going to be a TCP socket. It can be just about anything else that you can reliably send data, guarantee that it's going to get there, and that it's going to get there in the same order. Um, we'll, uh, if we have time, we'll be covering a little bit about how you can use SSH without necessarily doing direct TCP between the client and the server. Um, on top of that, you have an encrypted transport. Um, and this is what you know, most people think about SSH for is the, the encrypted aspect of it. You don't want other people snooping in on, on your uh, connection. Um, on top of that, there's the connection protocol and the authentication protocol. Of course, authentication is what um, allows the server to verify who the client is, whether it be your user or some kind of automated service or whatnot. There are a wide variety of methods that can be used for authentication. The SSH uh, RFCs only define a few, but they're, I mean, using different uh, frameworks and whatnot, you can do authentication in many different ways. Um, you have the connection protocol, which uh, is what actually maintains the state between the two sides. Uh, then on top of that, you have a concept of channels. Uh, and so SSH really is, is a multiplex transport. Over a single connection, it can carry multiple different types of traffic, whether it be your terminal session, whether it be an FTP session, whether it be a forwarded TCP session, whether it be your agent, uh, a SOX proxy, whatever else. Those, those are all, they would be uh, handled as a different channel inside of the SSH connection, and those channels all have uh, different IDs, uh, the different channel types, et cetera, for, for transporting the data across. And on top of that, you have all your, your applications that use SSH. All right, so to start off with, we're going to talk uh, a little bit of, uh, about uh, configuration. Most people, when they think about configuring SSH, they just think about configuring the SSH daemon. Uh, but you can also configure the client in many ways. And uh, on a per user basis, you can store configuration for your SSH client in your home directory in .ssh slash config. Um, it allows you to, you can put global defaults for your own user in there. You can also put per specific hosts. 
Uh, there are a variety of, wild, of things you can put in there. You can even wildcard based on your host name or other options so that you can ha say have one entry that applies to hosts that match this wildcard name and it will use those options based on that. So here's an example configuration file. Uh, it, so you can see up at the top we set three global variables. Um, then down below you, we have uh, three host definitions. Uh, if you look on, on the bottom one, uh, you see it has star.example.com. So in this case, if you do like ssh app.example.com, it's going to use that user known host file option that's specified there versus your normal known host file. Uh, and for example, on the other two, you can say uh, you, using the host name option, you can specify the actual IP address or the DNS name to connect to, so that um, when you do SSH, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to match the actual DNS name or IP address. It will then look it up in here. Uh, and of course, port and user common uh, things, especially uh, the case of an SSH jump host, they pe people frequently run it on a different port for security purposes. We have a question here. Oh, oh, yeah. Um, so the question was in this example, uh, I have a, for example, the lax.example.com and then I have a wildcard.example.com. I actually hadn't thought of that one. So I, I was just quickly hammering this sample config file out. I believe it, if you used lax.example.com in your SSH command, it will use the more specific options. Um, but I am not entirely sure, so that's something to experiment with. Thanks for pointing that out. All right, actually, so I'm gonna go ahead and leave that there and we're going to go to our shell and start working through things. So, um, oh, I forgot to clean up my environment. Excuse me for a moment. Actually, let's just get rid of all three of the, or all of those. Okay. So, we have a clean .ssh directory. So let's go ahead and edit our config file. I'm gonna throw just a, a couple uh, defaults that I like in here. Um, I, I like to turn off uh, this GSS API authentication. Um, what this is, if you're using Kerberos, you would wanna have this for your authentication. Um, I have found myself in the past that if you're SSHing from a Debian-based system to a Red Hat-based system, um, and that Red Hat-based system has, uh, depending on how it's configuration, it, it can cause quite a bit of lag in logging in to the system. It can take like 30 seconds to log in. And uh, I'm not using Kerberos authentication, so I just don't care. So I always turn it off. Um, but if you're using Kerberos, you definitely need that on. Um, I'm going to set server alive interval as well. Um, this is um, how often the client will make sure that the, the server is alive at, or that they have exchanged messages. So in some uh, situations, um, there's you know, some kind of stateful firewall or, or something between your client and the other end. And if, the, if no traffic has flown across a, a TCP session in so long, the firewall will, will close the session. Um, that can get re really annoying. And so by setting this to, to something lower than what that timeout is, it will keep, keep your session alive the whole time. Um, I'm also gonna set control path. Um, to something kind of cryptic. And uh, we'll, we will cover this one in a little bit. Um, I'm going to go ahead and add now a host, let's put an extra new line in here, add an extra host entry for my SSH gateway. We, I'm going to go ahead and indent the next few lines a little bit. You actually don't need to indent between host definitions. It will just go every line until the next host definition. I like to indent them just for, you know, readability purposes. Um, I am going to specify a port and a uh, user. Uh, because the on uh, this Jesse one VM 
my, my current user is not the same as the user on the other box. So by setting that here, I don't have to worry about typing it all the time. And uh, that should be sufficient. So now... Is the config file case sensitive? Yes, the config file... So the question was, is the config file case sensitive? It is. You do need to make sure you have case correct. It just does simple string matching. It doesn't do insensitive matching. So now I'm going to try SSHing to my SSH gateway. I now get a uh, warning, say, or a, I, I guess it's a warning, saying, um, I don't know who this is on the other side. Here's the fingerprint of the key that I got from them. Do you want to accept this? How many of you have just blindly said yes to this question in the past? If any of you have your hands down, you're lying. <laughs> so while we all should do it, we frequently do. We frequently don't check this. I'm going to show you how you can easily see from your host what the fingerprint is so that if you, you, so you can check it if you want to in the future. So I'm going to come over here to my SSH Gateway VM. Um, I'm logged in as root. I know bad security practice. Don't mind that. There's a reason. So to check uh, the, the fingerprint of a, a key file, we're going to do, uh, use the SSH keygen facility. So in the dash L option, we'll tell you, it will list the fingerprint. I'm going to add a dash V on here, which will also give a visual representation of the fingerprint. And then in the dash F, uh, I will specify the file. So in this case, I'm going to do uh, the host ECDSA key. So um, in, the, in this case, on, or on this box right now, there's a DSA key, an, an RSA key, an ECDSA, ED something, a bunch of numbers. Um, don't worry too much about those. I'm hand wavy, this is the one I want to check. So if you look here, you can see on the first line, it has a bunch of uh, hex numbers that are colon separated. And if you look at the end, you can see a 1A3922 and then the, the file name. And then it also has a kind of visual representation of the fingerprint. So if we come back here to our uh, client session here, you can see it, the, the fingerprint is 1A3922. So here we know we're talking to the right thing. So I'm going to go ahead and say yes while we have a question asked. Is there any way to actually show the fingerprint uh, representation when you log in? Uh, so the question is, is there a way to see the visual representation? Yes. Um, I don't remember the exact flag, but there is a command line option to the SSH client that you can use to do that. Man page has it in there. You can just search. I think if you just search for the word visual, I think it will tell you. Cool. So here we got our connection closed because we waited too long. Let's go ahead and try this again. So here you can see, even though I'm logged into to my current box's ITSA, it went ahead and used the, the username that I specified in my config file. So I'm going to log in using my password. No surprise, we logged in. Nothing, nothing fancy or nothing exciting there. Typing passwords all all the time sucks. So the common answer for for fixing that with SSH is use SSH keys. So let's go ahead and set some of those up. Um, so on Jesse here, I'm going to go ahead and generate some keys, just using SSH keygen. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and specify a type RSA. It actually does RSA by default. Uh, I think I can specify a 4096-bit key. Um, if you just do SH keygen, it picks sensible defaults. Don't worry too much about that. I'm just being a little fancy here. So you, it's now going to prompt me for what, where to store this key. This is the default location. I'm just going to go ahead and go with it. And it's then going to ask me for a passphrase to use for encrypting the private key. How many of you just hit entered here before? <laughs> the rest of you are lying. <laughs> what was that? Now I did this last night for the first time to your tutorial. Yeah, so someone was just saying they did it last night. So I'm going to go ahead and put in a uber secret password. And uh, so there it gets saved. Um, so my, my private key is now not encrypted, or is encrypted on disk, it's not in plain text. Got to know the passphrase to be able to use it. So if I try now to SSH to my gateway, oh, wait a second here. Huh? 
You need to move your key over. You need to send your key over. <laughs> your public key to the... Oh, that's right. So yeah. Um, so I need to copy my public key over to the remote host so that it no, uh, so the other side can authenticate me. There is one really cool utility for doing this. It's called SSH copy ID. And you can just give it the other side. And here it's just going to prompt me for the password to log into the other host. And then it's going to say you should log into it and check to make sure that's all, uh, all the keys you wanted. So, um, so one quick gotcha related to SSH copy ID. If you're going from an older Debian based distro, copying the key to a Red Hat based distro with SE Linux enabled, you might have to restore con on the Red Hat box on your authorized keys file because it might not label it properly. One, one gotcha I ran into in the past. Um, they fixed it, I think anything 12.4 later for Ubuntu or uh, I think squeezer later will be fine. I know Jesse works. Anyways, so now if I try to SH, okay, here, okay, it's asking me for, for the passphrase for the private key. That's encrypted on disk. The client can't get my, the key by itself. So I'm going to go ahead and put in my super secret pass, passphrase, and there I logged in. So I'm going to go log back out. But if I try to log in again, it's, gonna, it's still asking me for a password. Didn't we already establish that passwords suck? So <laughs> that's why you shouldn't. Well, I mean, you're going to store it to your teacher. Well, yes, yes. So that's where that's where we're going next. Is we're going to we're going to use something to help us so that we can leave it encrypted on disk, but not have to type the passphrase every time. And that's where the SSH agent comes comes into play. Which, uh, let's see. Let me go back here real quick, just to see if there's anything important on these. So we've covered all of this stuff. And now we're, we're back or to talking about the SSH agent. So uh, the SSH agent is a type of key ring. Um, what, what you'll do is you'll start the agent. You'll tell it to load your private key. It will read the, the encrypted bits off of disk. You'll give it the passphrase, and it will decrypt them in memory. Then you can use th uh, that agent to perform authentication to servers um, using that decrypted private key. Um, let's see. This a uh, little bit of the internals of how this works. We'll, we'll actually look at those here in a moment. Uh, near the bottom, um, one thing to note is that you don't have to necessarily use the SSH agent that is provided with your client. Um, there are many things that implement the SSH agent protocol. Um, for example, uh, GNOME Keyring. If you, if you have a GNOME or GNOME-based uh, GUI environment, most likely when you log in, it's going to start the GNOME key ring and um, set up everything to use that as your SSH agent instead of the open SSH one. So just as a little bit of note there, the only time that really comes import, comes, becomes important is if you're using um, features that are in the, SSH, the open SSH agent versus something like GNOME keyring. There, there are some differences there. Um, so anyways, let's see. So yeah, so here's some commands for it. Let's uh, go back to our terminal here. And if we just run SSH agent, um, we, we get some shell looking stuff here in our terminal. Um, and then if I, do, uh, if I uh, go looking for an a SH agent process, you can see that this PID 1040 is, is an SH agent that's running. Um, to, to use this one right now, I would need to um, basically run these three lines of commands. But that's kind of annoying. Um, so let me go ahead and there's a, a trick if you to just do it quickly. You can just do no eval SSH agent like this, and it just echoed the PID and uh, set every, set all my environment up for me. So let's uh, take a moment to kind of explore um, how this or how the mechanisms of this work. You can see that. Um, what, there were two environment variables that were shown up above. 
And uh, in my terminal now, I can uh, echo these out, and you can see they're set. And so this uh, SSH OSSOC is actually a Unix socket that the uh, SH agent is listening on. So if I do an ls-l on this, you can see it's in my file system. At the beginning, you see it's an S, so that's a socket. Um, only the user that I'm logged into has any uh, permissions to access it. And if we do uh, here, you can also see that the SSH agent is, is the, the other side of that socket. It's what's listening. Um, so let's go ahead and, we just started this agent up, but let's go ahead and do SSH add dash L. This will ask the SSH agent, what private keys do you currently have? In this case, we don't have any. So let's go ahead and do an SSH add. We could do a, a dash F to specify a specific file, and I'm gonna go ahead and do that here. But if you don't specify the file, it will just load the default, look, default path. Oh, actually you don't have to do dash F, you just do that. So now I'm going to put in my uber secret passphrase. And now, if I try SSHing to the other side, I, it didn't ask me for my passphrase. So this is stuff that I'm guessing a lot of you have seen before. Um, but I hope maybe seeing uh, some of the uh, uh, underpinnings uh, gives a little bit better understanding of it. So let's see. Let me go, go back to my notes here. All right, so say we've gotten to our SSH gateway, and um, we now want to SSH to our actual app server. So let's try that. We're getting asked for a password, which isn't too big of a surprise because, let's see, there probably is one in here. Yeah, um, ignore that. Me not cleaning things up. So my public key was not already on this box. So it makes sense that it wouldn't, wouldn't get there. So um, unfortunately I can't SSH copy ID because uh, the way the, the file names are uh, on the, in the directory at the moment. I'm just gonna go ahead and SCP this file across. All right, so I've got my authorized key now on the other side and if I Try SSHing again, I'm still getting asked for a password. Well, that's not cool. So the way we would get around this when going through multiple hosts is through SSH agent forwarding. So I'm gonna come back here to my original host and I'm gonna add a dash capital A. And that, this tells the SSH client that when it establishes the connection to the server to do agent forwarding. And let's go ahead and do this and let's kind of explore what was different here. If I do this now, you can see that I have the SSH offsoc environment variable set now. Uh, and it's pointing to a, uh, another file location. Note this is different than the one I had on, on the first host. You can see there it is. Um, interesting that it did those file permissions that way. Anyways. Did you declare your users open? Hmm? Did you declare your users open west in your config? Yes, my, my user is open west. So it's on, on both the SSH gateway and app01, the username is open west. On the first box, it's something else arbitrary that you don't need to worry about. What about that? Permissions of that directory? Yeah, I just noticed that myself. Um, let's, oh, so you're saying to look at the directory? Uh, let's do this. Okay, so in this case, the directory, uh, only the Open West user has the ability to, to see the contents of the directory. So that would prevent others from, from being able to see in there. Except for root, the root user can get in. It, you're, you're getting ahead of me. Hold on a second. So now if I try to SSH over to app01, I got in without a password. Now the way that this worked was that when I did that second SSH, um, it connected, and then to do the authentication, it talked back to 
its SSH OSSOC, which was a forwarded connection back to my original system and into its SSH agent. That way I don't have to copy my private keys to all the intermediate boxes. I can just keep my private key where it should be, which is on my system and encrypted. So, um, any questions so far? All right, so there's a reason though why this is not enabled by default in that there is a, a rather large security risk associated with this. And as uh, someone here started to point out, is that this is uh, a, a Unix socket and it's controlled by file system permissions. So anyone who could potentially access this file could uh, access my SSH agent. And we're actually gonna demo that a little bit right here. I'm gonna go to my, my root shell on my SSH gateway. Um, so I, so if I come in here, you can see I the root user can obviously ls this file. Um, let me try right now just by itself. Uh, yeah, we can go and accept that. If if root tries to sh to the other box as the open west user, it gets asked for a password. But if we export the sh off sock uh, to be this other socket we can magically get in. Yeah. So that it, it's a pretty big security hole. You're, you're not going to want to forward your agent to just any box. You're going to only want to forward it to, to things that you trust with a high degree of certainty. Um, now the, the little bit of upside to it is that if someone were to use this attack, they can't actually get your private key. All they can do is they can impersonate you while you're still connected. So you disconnecting um, would immediately cut their connection. They don't get any. Show the, huh? Show okay. So I'll go ahead and log back out here. So and then I'll go back to Jesse one and log this back out. So so there I I, I dropped my first connection all the way back out. So that forward socket wasn't there anymore. And when I tried his route to do it again, it's prompting for a password. But did it kick you out? It didn't kick you out. Oh, no, it wouldn't kick you out, no, because you're already authenticated at that point. It, it, oh, yeah. yeah, so if you, if you had, so, so once that session is initiated, the, the other user can hold on to it forever. Yeah. So. They could build their cells access or something. Yes. So, like I said, it's something you want to be, you want to be careful with. So. Which brings us to our next thing, which I, if I go back here to our presentation, I think I actually have these things out of order. So I'm going to skip forward a few slides and talk about, about the proxy command. So what is that technique called, the dash A? Agent forwarding. So and also if you don't want to type dash capital A every time you SSH, you can put that in your SSH config file. I would recommend putting it under a specific host entry. You just put forward, capital F, forward, capital A, agent, space, yes, and it will do it. Question? Does the dash A vulnerability only exist when you actually have a socket? So if you don't enable the, the socket. Uh... If you do not enable agent forwarding, then there is no risk. But so, yes, but if you don't enable it, then you can't use your agent beyond the one hop except for if you try to do something like the proxy command. So uh, the proxy command option, what it tells the SSH client to do is instead of creating a TCP session itself to the other side, run this command that you specify and use standard in and standard out of that command as the connection to the remote host. Um, and the example we have here um, is we're we're actually underneath going to do another SSH to a, to a remote host, and then we're going to use netcat. How many of you have used netcat before or NC? Okay, so some people hopefully know what's going on there. We'll use that to, to create a, a, a TCP session to the other side that goes to standard in and out of, of netcat. So we can actually uh, demo that real quick. So I'm just going to do this from the command line here. Um, if you want to specify uh, SSH options that aren't necessarily exposed as individual command line options, you can use dash O and then the full uh, SSH command option name. 
So in this case, I'll do proxy command equals. I'm going to say for this command sh to the sh gateway and then run netcat to this address. And, and um, before SSH runs the proxy command, it's going to replace the percent %h with the host of what you're connected to and the percent %p with the port. There are a few other uh, replacement strings that you can use uh, depending on whatever your particular use case is. And now I can run app 01 here. And you can see it's asking me for the fingerprint on the far side. I'm going to do that bad thing. And actually, I forgot to specify a user. And so specifying the right user, I got in properly to the other side. So here, I, did, I didn't have agent forwarding running. What happened was I sh to, to the sh gateway, spun up netcat, connected it to the SSH server, which then over that connection that got forwarded back, I created another SSH session on top of that. So the downside here is it's a little bit more ugly to, to at least set up the first time. Uh, there is more overhead in doing this because you actually have a SSH session inside of an SSH session. So you're encrypting things twice, extra CPU overhead, um, modern computers, meh, they do it quick enough, it doesn't matter. But you're not vulnerable. Huh? But you're not vulnerable. You are not vulnerable in this case to the SSH agent forwarding attack because you have not forwarded your agent. Um, if I go back here to my SSH gateway, there's no. There's yeah, like there's there's no socket there to connect to. Are you even connected to that server anymore? Or? Yes. So if I uh, well, let's see. Uh, Uh, did I, I, no. let's see. Uh, oh, I didn't want L, I want it. If you look here, you can see I have a connection established to the SSH daemon on this host. And then if I look at NC, you can see it's connected to the other side. Okay. So that's how that's working. Make sense? All right, we're moving on because it's uh, we're running out of time. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about forwarding at the moment unless we have time at the end. I want to cover Control Master. So this is a rather useful uh, use of the multiple channels that are available inside of an SSH session. Um, it, what this does is it, when you start up your first SSH session, it's going to connect to the remote server. Then as you spin up additional SSH sessions, they're going to just piggyback on top of the first one instead of doing a full negotiation. Where this might be really useful is if, say, you're, you're spinning up lots of connections to, a, to an SSH jump host, or if you're doing uh, lots of connections over long links, like, say, if you're SSHing to the moon or Mars or something like that. Um, the, the overhead of that initial uh, connection setup can, can be quite a bit. And so by combining these into a single session, you can uh, reduce the time to get those uh, other terminals, those other connections. So let's uh, go ahead and come over here to uh, our host again. So I'm going to go ahead and create my first session. Um, Uh, equals. I'm going to set it as auto, which means if there's not a connection, go ahead and create one. If there is a connection, use it. And then I'll do my SSH gateway. So you can see I've logged in here. Um, let's do uh, so you can see, uh, no, I didn't want the L. I want just that. So you can see I have one TCP session currently open. Yeah. So if I come over here to another terminal window for on Jesse one and do the same command, uh, I now have a new. I've logged in. If I check here, you can see I, I'm I'm logged in twice. There are, I do actually have two terminals. But if we come back here and look at our netstat again, you can see there's still only one TCP connection between the client and the server. So this could be useful in several situations. 
say for example with an SSH jump host where you're making where you're probably going to be making lots of connections so you can talk to multiple servers on the other end. This lets you multiplex them into a single connection. So I hand raised. Yeah. Does this do you run into any performance issues or speed issues or something? So the question is uh, performance or speed issues. Um, I haven't noticed any performance or speed issues myself yet. Um, it's not. You're still only ha you only have one encrypted session, and it's encrypting the bits once. It's not like you're adding additional overhead of additional rounds of encryption. But there is another security gotcha, which is the exact same one as the agent forwarding. Um, although this is this is limited to the host that you're initiating the SSH from. So in this case, my first box. But if I was doing control master, say on my jump host to other boxes, I would need to worry about it on the jump host as well. Which is this is handled through uh, another socket. And if I look here, uh, I have a socket in my file system that only I have permission to read to at the moment, but it's not stopping the root user from doing it. So again, the root u someone else who has permission to, to be able to read this could impersonate me and, and piggyback off this connection. So I saw, have I raised. Um, wouldn't it be easier to just use like Tmux from your initial sessions, so you just open several windows in that. So the question is using Tmux on the original host. Um, yes, you could. Uh, that's obviously a, a way you could do it. Um, but I'm guessing that considering the number of laptops I am seeing in the room, that most people's first machine that they're going to be SSHing from is a laptop. And so if you say you're at work. Oh, yeah. So you want to, so doing Tmux on the jump host. Because that's what you were saying, you would need to open several connections. Yes, you, you could do that. Um, there is a, another kind of gotcha related to that. If you are using agent forwarding and you disconnect and reconnect, your SSH auth sock is now different. And so you would need to, to, to change that to update it on, on all of your SSH sessions. Or I actually have a, a trick for that one. In uh, Let's come over here to app01. Actually, let me. So I have a few uh, six lines commented at the end of this file that I had previously set up. Um, if you have something like this in there, where it will sim link around your SSH auth sock and and update your environment variables properly, you can reconnect to that Tmux session and re and regain your agent forwarding abilities. So, making sense so far, or am I completely confusing you guys? Sounds like it's making sense. So good. All right, let's see where we're at. Uh, the last one I want to get to, and hopefully, yeah, we have a few minutes. Um, having to worry about distributing SSH keys all over the place is a bit of a pain in the rear end. Um, there are ways to handle it, say through configuration management, configuration management systems such as Puppet uh, or you know, Ansible, whatnot. Um, but wouldn't it be nice if we had a, a really simple way to, to do that? And there kind of is one, which is a relatively new feature uh, of OpenSSH called SSH certificates. So let me show you those real quick. Um, with SSH certificates, you set up a, a SSH key that you're going to define as your certificate authority. In this case here, let me get back in here. Let me get back to my original host. I have this SHCA directory, and inside I have a couple files. Uh, the first one is a private SSH key generated just through SSH key gen like normal, as well as the public key to go with it. Uh, the extra file in there is I went ahead and copied the public key of my SSH jump host to the box so that I can do something with it here in, here in a moment. First thing I want to do is let's make it so that um, I don't have to worry about copying my authorized keys file everywhere. I just want to have the CA key, public key copied everywhere, and I want the server open or the SH server to just trust anything signed by that key or by that CA. So I'm going to start off with here. Let's see. Let me go into this directory. I'm going to use SH key gen again. I'm going to use the dash s uh, command and uh, give it the my the private key for my CA. Let's see, I need to get some notes here. Um, 
then I'm going to give it an identity. Um, in this case, I'm just going to do uh, the the user and host of the of the SSH gateway. This one doesn't matter all that much. It's just really some kind of identifier for um, uh, the key. Then we're going to do uh, a dash n to, to specify a, a actual username, a principal on this. This has to match the username of whoever is logging into the remote host. So I'm going to go ahead and define this as open west as well. And then I'm going to specify uh, my own public key. And you can see there at the bottom it said signed user key at, at that um, valid forever. So this is one cool thing you can do with these as well. You can actually define particular permissions that a uh, SSH certificate can use uh, as well as a time frame form. So uh, I think it's actually, if, you, if I look at my .sh directory, there's now a idrsa cert.pub. So let me go ahead and do uh, let me cut oh I need to come over to my jump box now and I need to edit my SSH config for the server to allow that if I uh, uh, let's see uh, nope that wasn't oh uh, we're I guess I didn't copy my uh, CA public key before yet. Yeah. So, uh, so let me grab a copy of my certificate authority's private key. I'm going to come over here. Uh, I'm going to create a new file with it and then edit. Ah. And do um, trusted user CA. Uh, I think it's CA key. Trusted user CA keys. And then we'll specify the path to that. And now we'll go ahead and restart the service. Uh, restart. And let me go ahead and remove the authorized keys for the for the OpenWest user. So now, if I come back over here and do, uh, let me, um, yeah. So even though I removed my authorized keys from the SSH gateway box, I was still able to log in because it has trusted the the uh, CA certificate or the CA key that I have a signed certificate for and it negotiated using those and uh, logged me in without that. So that's what you could do is you could have one centralized CA sign all your user certificates by that distribute that public key everywhere on your boxes and you inher get inherently get trust there. Isn't that so. the same amount of work though? Um, no, it's you're setting up one key versus one key per user. I, I could I could sign a, a key for another user using the same CA key, okay. and that user would be trusted as well. Oh, I gotcha. Okay. So. Can yes, you can revoke. There's an option for uh, have for specifying a, a revocation list to the SSH daemon, and it will uh, not allow those keys to connect. So it's very it's it's a very similar concept to to SSL certificates and keys, just uh, with a slight variation for SSH itself. All right, so I think I am out of time. Um, let me go back to the presentation and uh, let's see. So we covered the certificates here. I'm not going to cover that. Here's uh, where I got most of my reference from for this. Um, really, the the man pages for SSH and uh, SHD as well as SSH underscore config, SHD underscore config are all rather awesome. They spell things out very clearly uh, and easy to read. Um, so yeah, and in case you're wondering, this presentation was done using an app called Presenti. 
written by a guy who did a talk at LCA this year. I thought it was cool. I'm much more of a text-based guy myself, so I decided I had to use it. So, all right. Well, thank you for coming. If you have, uh, I'm going to be here the rest of the day. If you have questions, let me know.